I'm Ronan McGuinness. I live here in Australia in a city called Perth on the west coast of Australia. And one of my main ministry involvements is that I coordinate Ignite Youth Perth. So Ignite Youth in Perth is connected to our national body and people from Perth travel here for this event, the Ignite Conference, to gather with others from around Australia, those that are involved in Ignite Youth or come to experience what we at Ignite Youth are able to contribute. I've been in ministry for about 15 years and have a particular passion for leadership to be able to help people who are in leadership roles or perhaps progressing towards leadership roles in ministry. And like many people involved in Ignite Youth, uh, there's other things that we're involved in as well. So I'm active in my parish in Perth and another event organisation called the Catholic Guy Ministry. And Ignite Youth is something I'm really, really passionate about. And uh, this conference is a big part of that. The session I'm really excited to be presenting is called The Seven Struggles of Ministry Leadership. And I'm hoping that this session is attended by those who are in ministry roles and perhaps scratching their head with struggles that they're not sure how to solve or those that are new to leadership to prepare them for the sake that leadership does involve struggles. I think sometimes we come along to these conferences and we get really, really excited about our faith, about encountering Christ, and we should get excited about that too. Truth is, for those of us who are leaders, we then go back into day-to-day -day ministry where things are not always easy. And so this session is designed to prepare people for that reality and to equip them with some strategies that they'll be able to implement when those struggles arise. There's certainly nothing that I can say that would prevent people from ever having struggles in ministry leadership, but I can share with them from my experience things that will help them when they do encounter those struggles. I want to uh, start this off by getting you to ask a question to the neighbour beside you. Okay, and the question is this, what has been your greatest struggle relating to leadership and or ministry? I think it's important as we start this topic that we just acknowledge that, that struggles are present in leadership, especially in ministry leadership. I think a mistake that we can sometimes make when we come to Ignite Conference, this is my eighth Ignite Conference without missing any, I love it every time, um, is we can spend time down there in the expo, which I love, and there's enthusiasm and a real vibe, and people walk around, oh, I haven't seen you since last year, how's things going? Yeah, great. And there's this, if there's some sort of pressure in ministry leadership to pretend that everything's always great, have you noticed that? Oh, things are fantastic, things are good. How have you been? Busy, yeah, busy, okay? <laughs> is, everyone says it, don't they? Is, is that good busy or is that bad busy because we're still pulling our hair out about some of the struggles that we haven't worked out how to solve yet. Now there probably could be a hundred struggles of ministry leadership, all right? But there's seven that we have the opportunity to talk about today. We'll jot them down and discuss them as we go. Number one is this, the struggle of resources. Thought I'd put the big one out there early. I can't remember the last time I talked to a leader in ministry who said, we got all the resources we need. Like just this, oh, all I've got to do is ask the boss for more money and the money just comes flowing. Yeah, nobody needs, to, nobody needs to check off on it. It's just always there for me. Now, even if some people, depending on their context of ministry, might be blessed with a big budget, that's great. 
They normally swap that problem for another resources problem, such as nobody wants to volunteer or, or, or whatever it might be. Or we've got all this volunteering but no experience, and that's our, our, our lack of resource that we have. But anyone I've ever met in ministry seems to come across this struggle of resources. And you can swap one part of that struggle for another part of the struggle, but it seems to be something that doesn't go away. You see, I've had so many conversations with people who say, if we can just get the financial monkey off our back, meaning if we can just get the big donation or the big grant that we need, then everything will be okay. It's, it's not going to solve our problem. And very often, we spend so much time chasing the resources, I wonder if you've noticed this, that you're putting so much focus on that, that you're missing ministry opportunities in other parts of ministry start to have little fractures and cracks come into that part of the ministry. I share with you an example of about um, seven or eight years ago, I was leading a retreat team as I did for many years. And um, a retreat team uh, like Net Team, or Youth Mission Team and others that we hear about in this context, our team was called Youth Impact and they were a team of largely volunteers who would do you know, a real slog in schools and in the tough ground, um, you know, the ground zero of youth ministry. And I sensed about halfway through the year that in this particular year they were finding it tough that um, being a little demotivated, a little overworked, I thought we need to do with short notice, a couple of weeks, is bring the team together and we're going to have a team retreat. We booked a little campsite. And we thought well, everyone's gonna be there for 48 hours and we're gonna have some us time. And I wanted to make sure they had an encounter experience, some training experience and some just joy and fun about it. And I remember thinking, well, this wasn't budgeted for, okay? This struggle of resources. How are we going to be able to do this? Got just enough money to, to be able to afford the cheapest campsite near where we were. But then I thought, well, this isn't really tough if they just come together and we've got nothing that's fun about this experience. They're pouring themselves out all the time. What can I do? And I started Googling for certain things that I thought they might enjoy. I thought, oh, I know what we'll do one night. It's going to be in winter. I'll organise um, a wood-fired pizza van to come along and cook pizza for them all. And they wouldn't expect that because none of our camps have that. And, and that would be really exciting for them. And I started Googling to find out the price of that. Oh no, for a like, retreat team of 15 people, this is just not economic, $1,000 minimum spend and a surcharge for coming to the country campsite and all this stuff. I thought we've got no chance of being able to afford that. And that's when I thought, well, just have to give in to, to this struggle, the struggle of resources, nothing we can do about it. And it was someone else who said to me, Here, here's an idea, Ronan. And to start with, I thought it was a lame idea. It worked fantastic. They said, go down to the fruit and veggie shop. And for $10, get the biggest bag of potatoes you possibly can, some alfoil, and then sour cream and cheese and other stuff that you do on baked potatoes. They said, at, while, whilst you're there at this camp, just choose a few hours where you light a fire out in the campsite area there, and you sit around, everybody puts whatever toppings they want on these baked potatoes, and sit around and just tell stories and share life around these baked potatoes for a while. Oh, really? Because I had this pizza van, it's going to be fantastic, and music out of the thing. No. So we did it with the baked potatoes. It cost us about $20. And, no joke, it was probably one of the best nights of ministry that I've been part of whilst we were there. It was just wrapping potatoes in foil and finding sticks to throw them in the fire and all sorts of hazardous things did take place then, by the way, okay? Um, but with, as leaders, I think they, they kind of knew where the boundary was with, with that. And we just sat around stuffing our face with potatoes and then it turned into let's get apples. Some people had apples and we turned into put apples in there and things as well. Out of control, all right? But it was 20 bucks compared to a thousand bucks. And the lesson I learned that night is not that everybody should do baked potatoes. Don't hear, hear me say that. Is that... The struggle wasn't the resources, okay? Well, that, was, that, that, that struggle wasn't something that I could overcome. What I needed to do was say, how do I struggle to use the resources that I do have? And I could do it with 20 bucks as a result. And so I think sometimes we think that this, this resource flow is going to be the answer to everything. And it would be great if it could be the answer to everything. But in light of the fact it's probably not going to be the answer, it's probably not a, a viable answer for many of us, then we need to work out how do we struggle to best use the resources that we do have and to think outside the box. We've done other things too, even at Ignite Live in Perth. I remember last year, we wanted to make one of them extra special and so we hired in like one of those big inflatable, not jumping castles, but like obstacle courses that would be heaps of fun. And it did, it cost us $600 and people did have a good time. Fantastic, no worries. The next time when we had Ignite Live a month later, didn't have the money in the budget to get that. So we went down the shop and bought some remote control cars from Kmart for about 15 bucks and set up a course with masking tape on the pavement. And people were having more fun with that 
than they did the week the month before with the $600 big inflatable thing. And I remember on the night when they were having so much fun, like there was just queues of people wanting to have a go on the remote control cars, thinking to myself, I wish they weren't having so much fun, okay? Because we spent all this money last time, they're supposed to think this is lame so that next time we'll do something big again, okay? But no, I think often what we need to do is say, what resources do we have? Let's be creative with it and not spend our whole ministry time trying to gather more resources. The answer's probably not there. Okay, number two, we're gonna get through seven of them, is the struggle of commitment from others. We're blaming everybody else here. It's never my commitment, that's a whole other talk, but the struggle of commitment from others. Now, if, if you're a leader in ministry, and you've never had this go through your mind before, where you're like, why aren't other people committed the way they need to be? Then firstly, you either haven't been in ministry long enough, okay? And I would suggest it's probably been less than 48 hours, no. Or, <laughs> or secondly, you're an absolute saint. And that's fantastic. Because it's something that's gone through my head all the time, in so many different contexts. Where you've got a vision for something, and you're trying to build something, and you think, why aren't other people committed like I am or like this team of people are? And we, can, we put into our mind, these were the committed people and these are the non-committed people. And they play that over in our head all the time, wondering why, why, why aren't others committed? Well, there's no magic switch that we can hit to all of a sudden make people committed. So many of the people that we wish were more committed are actually wonderful Christians. Many of the people that we wish were committed um, have a lot to offer and are extremely gifted. Many of them are at their limit of what they perhaps even should be contributing. But it's natural as a leader to think, gosh, I just need more commitment from others. I would suggest to you that it's best, it's not in the notes, but you can scribble it if you wish. There's kind of three categories that I think leaders often struggle with in terms of others being committed. The first category is the commitment of those who have appointed us to leadership, where we feel they're no longer committed to what they asked us to do. I wonder if you've ever felt like that, where you thought, I was asked to do this by the parish priest, by the school principal, by a director of the region or whatever it might be, and now they've left me on my own. Or they haven't given me the support that I need, or they've forgotten about how important this is. That's the first category, so those, those people above us, I'll say, those people who have appointed us, and we struggle when we feel like they're not committed. The second, and perhaps one of the most common, is the people who we're expecting to serve beside us, People who are supposed to be helping us. And I wonder if you ever in a leadership meeting where you're taking notes or minutes, you're writing down who's going to do what after the meeting, and you think, why is my name being written down next to everything? Okay? You, say, you go away and you even look at it afterwards if you've done this, where you count up who's been assigned what to do. And you say, I've been given seven of them, this person's been to, how did Jenny's name not even get on the list? Jenny's not committed enough, or whatever. Why didn't she not put her hand up for anything? Sorry if there's any Jenny's in the room, okay? But that's what we talk about when we say the struggle of the people beside us that we're expecting to be supporting us. Then the third one is those that we actually exist to serve, and we get frustrated where they don't seem committed, and it's supposed to be for them anyway. Have you realised that? How hard is that? Like I know that from being out every Friday night, running a Friday night youth group, and all of a sudden someone's got a 14th birthday party on and everybody goes to that. And the next week it's four weeks until school exams are on, so nobody's, I'm like, four weeks away, why aren't you guys committed? Or whatever it might be. And we sit there and think, you think oh, I want to give up my Friday night? I'm not out here for my sake, I'm here for your sake. Why aren't you committed? Okay, we're putting on this holiday activity for you. Why aren't, why haven't you signed up? Why are you still thinking about it? Do you know how hard it is to organize because you people haven't decided yet whether you're coming along to this or not? Now, I've gone through that struggle a hundred times, okay? <laughs> and I take it from your response as something you've, you've dealt with as well. The reason I separate it out into those three categories is you need to deal with it differently, okay? They're, they're, there's different solutions because it's a different mindset that's going on. The, the questions to ask that relate to that is these. Those that are appointed us, if we, if we think, if, if our perception is that they're not committed to us, we need to stop and ask ourselves the question, am I building what they asked me to build? Like, am I leading actually what I was asked to lead? Or is there a chance that I've gone off on a bit of a tangent with goodwill often and good heart, but as a result, that leader who appointed me is saying, I just 
can't give Ronan full support right now because I don't know exactly if he's doing what we need him to be doing. So sometimes when you look at us and the results from there, with those that should be more committed beside us, serving with us, I think we often need to ask the question, am I giving them meaningful opportunities to serve or are the things that I'm expecting others to be doing to make this successful, am I giving them silly menial tasks that they're not ready for yet? They haven't built up the character or the conviction that they need to do those menial tasks. We want them to be able to see the value in that. Sometimes with those serving aside us, we need to stop and say, I need to help them understand the value of the tasks or assign them tasks they place value to to be committed. And then with the, the third one, when I said serving the needs of those that the ministry is, is set up to serve, are we actually meeting the needs that they have? Or is it our perception of the needs that they have? So if we're doing a high school youth group, have we genuinely made sure that what it is we've established is meeting their needs? Or is that the reason that they're perhaps not as committed? Because we think what's happening is a good idea, but it's, it's, it's not what they're seeing. And here's the big conundrum in all this. Often each of those are very different. For example, parish priest appoints me to be youth leader in my parish. And father says, what I want you to build is more teenagers coming to mass on Sunday morning. Then I look at the teenagers who aren't committed and they're saying, Ronan, what I need you to build is something that's heaps and heaps of fun for us to be involved in and run around a lot. Okay? Those things don't necessarily marry up, do we? So that takes wisdom in leadership to say, how do I try and incorporate the, the very needs there and, and communicate them and, and, uh, and divide them out into different parts of our program that we offer and, and that kind of thing. But it's a, there are important questions to ask when we encounter this in our mind, others aren't committed. Why isn't they committed? Which category is it that they're fitting in? And what are we going to do about that? Okay, number three. Number three, the struggle of strategic planning. A lot of people don't talk about this. Without me saying too much to start with, I want to ask you this question. I'll put it on the bottom of the screen. Chat about this with your neighbour, but try and stick exactly to this question. What are some of the new advancements that are already being planned for your ministry? Not what's working best, not what's something new you started recently, but, but thinking something that plans are already in place for this new advancement to take place um, in the near to not too distant future. Most people don't have anything that is a genuine strategic plan with an intention behind it and, and resources allocated and decisions being made and steps put in place of, of something that you're progressing towards. Many people have good ideas, but there's a big difference between we have an idea on the horizon and we've got a strategic plan, a strategy in place written down for something that we're going to be introducing, which we see real value and purpose in. And the reason is, I don't blame anyone for this. I know about it. The reason is, it's too hard working out main maintenance mode, isn't it? Keeping afloat the things that need to happen, the rosters that need to happen, putting out little spot fires here and there with this person disappointed about this and this person needing more of that. And so, so often in ministry, we never stop and say, what's the next step? And, and how are we actually putting plans in place to get there? And it's a massive struggle, but something that we have to make time for. I know last year in Ignite Youth in, in Perth, we got to the point where we thought we were where we needed to be, get this. We wanted to see ourselves like a really stable point where we didn't want to be in startup mode. You know when it always feels like you're in startup mode all the time, like we're nearly there, we're nearly there, I'm in startup mode for 10 years, nearly there, okay? And, and that's often a reality. We got to the point where we weren't in startup mode anymore, which is great, that the roles that needed to be filled had been filled. We were in a cycle of events that were succeeding to the, to the benchmarks that we had decided. And I thought, this is great, we can now be like this forever. Ministry is going to be so much easier now because we've hit that point. <laughs> didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen is because often the best leaders around you, they need to see some sort of strategic plan for what's next. Everyone dreams of being in maintenance mode in ministry where we don't have to be working for the next thing. But that's actually a heart, like when you get to maintenance mode, if you're genuine leaders, you've got a heart for people and you want to see things progress, then, then you actually do need that next thing on the horizon that you're working towards, um, you know, to be, to be fueling your enthusiasm and energy and to be forcing you to raise up new leaders and all the things that leadership involves. So I pointed out today, 
as something that's hard to get time to do, but something that does have massive dividends if we can get to that point, the idea of strategic planning. If, if you want more help on that, then chase me up afterwards. Number four, struggle of life balance. And what a struggle it is, apparently for everybody in society, let alone those of us that have this beast called ministry and leadership that we add on to our life. I want to do a quick challenge with everybody. Can I invite you to please stand up where you are? You can, the things that are in your hand, just leave them on the seat. So we're just standing in our space. Okay, here's what I'm going to invite you to do. I promise this will be the most physical activity and, uh, that I ask you to do, and it, and it won't be in uh, any kind of difficulty league. Can I get you to please have both hands out wide, try not to smack the person next to you, okay? And what I want you to do now is choose one foot that you're going to stand on. I want you to balance on that one foot, okay? And I want you to stay perfectly balanced for 30 seconds. As perfectly balanced as you can, starting now. Oops, don't look at me, it'll make it harder for you. <laughs> 15 seconds in. 30 seconds is a long time when you have to do something like this. Three, two, one, and time's up. Sit down, I'll tell you why I made you do that. Good job. Okay. <laughs> now, now, some people passed in flying colours, by the way. Some people uh, passed in flying colours. Anyone wearing a blue Marist Youth Ministry shirt did not pass in flying colours because they were the, uh, the failures at all corners of the room. Okay. Only at that. I'm sure you're amazing and everything. Very good. Oh, one, one succeeder. Claiming one succeeder. Okay. Very good. The reason I, I challenge you to do that is we're all standing up, we had one challenge, which was to be perfectly balanced, okay? I, I stood here and watched on this angle. I'm not sure what you were watching at this point in time. What's awesome, and I was hoping it would happen and it did, is because there's windows along this side of the room, one of them's not blank, blacked out at the back. You saw someone walking past over there, because they've got like prayer rooms and things over there, and they're like, this is the spiritual part of the complex. And you saw someone just walk past and go, yeah, what's there's a keynote session? People, what, 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 what's like Ronan's meditation hour? Okay, we're doing it like that, and this is a prayer room, okay. Um, now, their assumption would be this. Let me just make it simple. Their assumption would be this. Everyone in that room is standing there perfectly balanced. You and I are in here looking at some of the failures around us saying that person definitely wasn't perfectly balanced or speaking for ourselves, as I speak for myself saying I was definitely not perfectly balanced. The point is this, from a distance, we looked perfectly balanced. In amongst it, there is no balance, all right? And leadership is often like that. Other people assume that we are doing a great job with our balance. Or many of you admire other leaders that you look up to and you follow them on social media. They're an amazing leader. How do they get all this great stuff done in their life? They're such a balanced person. You're watching from a distance like a passing window. I've never met a leader that says, yep, I've got the balanced thing sorted. Okay? Doesn't mean, doesn't mean some people aren't excellent at maintaining balance, but it's always a struggle for them. Yeah? There's no one strategy that would have had us perfectly standing still because guess what happened? What you were doing as you were doing that was you were changing your weighting. We were all doing it using our hand, a central body weight or our foot. We were changing our weighting in order to be balanced. That's prioritizing and that's leadership. Changing what we need to do at any one point in time to maintain balance. Balance is not something you achieve. It is something you're continuously changing your waiting on. I've got to spend a heap of time on something with the family for the next couple of weeks and it's a major priority. I've got, a, I've got a big lead up into a ministry project and that's just going to take priority. Or at the same time as that is some study I'm doing and it's all coming to a head with that and I've got to have that priority happening as well. But this whole idea of just get to balance and then just live the balanced ministry life, it's not that easy. It's the continual idea of changing your priorities and being aware of this struggle, living amidst the struggle of the balance. And the other point there too is, we should as, as leaders always have honest conversations with others about how they're going in terms of their balance. Because from a distance, we think they're going great, don't we? Whereas maybe there really could be something that, that we wouldn't be able to help them with if we were amidst, uh, amidst it like, uh, like, like they 
Uh, like we're closer to someone in that conversational sense. Okay, better get through the last few. Number five, the struggle of keeping momentum. When if you've been through this before, where you have something that's really successful, and you think, yes, great, fantastic. And then it's an event or another part of the program that you offer that takes place not that long after. And you think, uh-oh, I thought we'd turn that corner and everything was on the right path, but we've just fallen flat in a heap with this next thing that's taken place. Oh gosh, it's a struggle to get the momentum. And then it's a real struggle to keep momentum. I want you to consider this little ministry principle that I've been thinking lots about the last couple of years. There's a big difference between ministry momentum, which is important and possible, and ministry inflation. I'll give you the idea. Ministry inflation is when we do something that's really successful. And so we think, okay, cool. It was so good. Next time we better make it better so that people are pleased with it. So we need a better speaker next time than what we even did last time to impress people more. We need a bigger stage next time. We need more lights next time. We need a longer camp next time. We need better food next time or whatever it might be. And we keep thinking that the way to have momentum is what's called ministry inflation, always having to add on and add on and add on. And that can be really, really damaging. Put that with some of the other things, commitment. There's a lot of work required. Put that with the resources challenge. So ministry inflation is extremely dangerous. So should we, should we aim for better? Of course we should, and for excellence. But we cannot fall into this trap of ministry inflation. So ministry momentum is asking a different question. It's saying, what's the part of our ministry that is giving us the momentum that we need? And really stopping and identifying that. And you might say, oh, it's not the big teenage out outreach group that does have 100 teenagers coming. The thing that's so important for our momentum is that the um, leadership mentoring group with 10 young adults, they drive everything that we do. We need to put a lot of time and effort into that and make sure that that is protected and celebrated and resourced within our, within our ministry. For Ignite Youth, our broader ministry of Ignite Youth, this conference is what gives us a lot of momentum. Like even as someone who's part of Ignite Youth via our events in Perth, we draw momentum from this event each year. And so this conference is protected in the Ignite Youth calendar while some other things need to change or more or less resources allocated, that kind of thing. A lot of Ignite Youth's momentum is built from this conference. And so we've identified that and therefore we make sure that it's something that's prioritised, that people are part of and that we're protecting it. So I encourage you, okay? Stop and consider, I'll give you a moment to do it now, what could it be in your ministry that does seem to generate momentum? It may not be the biggest thing, it may be. It may not be the most regular thing, but it's the thing that seems to keep rolling on, giving people the fire in the belly, where the relationships are perhaps the best, whatever it might be, but something you can point to as a successful part of your ministry that has momentum as part of it. Okay, so the important thing is, you identify where you're driving your momentum from, you protect it and build as much momentum as you can around that continuously, not always having to fall into this trap of the next bigger, better thing. Just protect that thing that gives you momentum. Okay, uh, number six, the struggle of pleasing everyone. We put a caveat over this. Everyone is important, okay? Everyone is a good person. You know how hard it is to keep everybody happy. Don't you? No, you're saying, no, I don't know how hard it is because no one's ever got to that point, okay? We know how impossible it is to be able to keep everyone happy. What I must point out as we discuss this though, is that some people there, therefore, some leaders use this as an excuse to then disregard people. I'll do what I want because you can't keep everybody happy. We cannot keep everybody happy, but we can care for everybody. And there's a big difference in leadership when we do that. We cannot use this as an excuse to steamroll people, to disregard people. Ministries fall apart when that happens. We must say this is a struggle, but the way that I'll deal with it is by caring for everybody. And look, there's no rocket science here, but it's still hard to do. The, the solution just about always lies in relationships, doesn't it? Where you say, I'm making a decision that I know will upset this other person but I've got a firm relationship with them. I'm gonna prioritize my relationship with them. I'm going to talk them through the decision that we've made. I know it's not going to please them and we use it as an opportunity to build the relationship with them. If we're too afraid, this is your warning for you. 
If we're too afraid to have a conversation that we know is going to upset someone, it's because we haven't invested the time in the relationship as a leader beforehand. It's hard to go back, but we've got to prioritise that from the beginning, therefore. We're prioritising our relationships around us. This won't end up becoming a hurdle that you cannot overcome. Okay, last one. Struggle of embracing the role as Jesus would. Embracing the role of leadership or the particular role or portfolio or job that you've been given as Jesus would. There's different ways to approach this. Truth is, so often we don't feel worthy to be in the role that we're in. Now, for many of us, that's a spiritual struggle. For some of us, we don't feel worthy in a practical struggle as well, in the sense of, oh, I'm not trendy enough to be leading this youth organisation, or I'm not experienced enough to do all the practical things that need to, need to take place, or I don't have enough relationships that I can draw upon, but I'll just do my little bit if you want me to, okay, or whatever it might be. But you think about it, if Jesus was given your leadership role, whatever it is, whatever it is here, how would Jesus embrace that role? Probably full on. He'd say, okay, let's get started. I'll tell you what Jesus would say. He'd certainly say yes to it. And he'd say, I'm in this for the long term. Okay, I'm in this for the long term. One of the things that frustrates me, I don't know why it happens, but especially in youth ministry, people seem to do everything in one year cycles. And I, I know why. It's kind of because it's, youth ministry is often linked to school settings and things like that. Okay. And it makes sense in a school setting because it's a curriculum that we're following. In youth ministry, we should never be talking in one year time frames because we build this habit of I'll do it for one year or my year's nearly up, can't wait till my year's up. And then everybody's hearing that. And it seems like ministry is some major sacrifice that you make for a period of time while life's going to be terrible. And then afterwards, I'll get my actual life that I enjoy back. Okay? The church needs us to be able to say, I will embrace this with my life. My role may change a little bit, but I'm in ministry leadership for the long haul. Think about the, the moment um, in our faith story. Think about when Angel Gabriel came to Mary. And we've seen it in primary school plays a thousand times, right? And because it's acted out in primary school plays, they add all this stuff in that, doesn't, that never actually happened, if you read the scriptures. It was actually quite a very simple encounter. But primary school plays at the assembly need to go for five minutes. So they make them go, about, like Gabriel flies in, hi oh, Mary, and Mary's there like stroking this big long hair like this. And Gabriel, your hair looks gleaming, Mary. And Mary's like, thank you, angel, thank you. And they have this like, none of that actually happened, all right? None of those conversations. But when the angel Gabriel said to Mary, you're going to carry Christ. Her first thing was a kind of question slash perhaps objection. And she said, and I'll read directly, she said, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. Fair enough question, right? Fair enough question. If she just went, yeah, okay. Okay, we'd be saying, hang on a second. Does she have any sense at all? So she asked one question, clarified the job description a tiny bit, okay? But after that one question, she followed that up with, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. She asked one question, made sure she was hearing it right, and then said, yes, she embraced the role, didn't she? Embraced the role. But what happens when someone comes to ask and us and asks us to do something in ministry? So many people, Angel Gabriel comes down, Ronan, I need you to organise Ignite Youth Perth. And I'm seeing a long hair. No, I don't have long hair. Yeah, I, have. I wish I had long hair. And I turn, as all of us turn, we have our excuses. I'll do it for one year. Okay, imagine if Mary said that. I'll be the mother of Jesus for one year, then I'm out of the picture. I'm out of, I'll carry him, but then that's it. I'm out of here. Okay, but we put time frames on it. Or we say, well, why don't you go and ask somebody else if they'll take on the role? And if everybody else says no, then come back to me. I might say yes. What kind of obedience is that? But we do it. Okay, some of you know that's been you and it's been me before too. Or we ask someone, they go, oh, let me check my uni schedule. Okay, I'm like, if you're saying no, just say no. Don't butter it up with some uni schedule thing. Okay, let's talk about this. But there's these things, everybody, no one's to embrace it full on. Okay, the church needs us to embrace our ministry full on. And yes, I'm called to the vocation of marriage and I'm called to corporate employment that I do and all this. But I'm also called to youth ministry and I'll do it for life if need be. Because that's what, that's what God's asking of his servants, isn't he? And you've got to interpret exactly what the parameters are for you. 
But I'm just trying to point out, let's, let's not go to the bottom, lowest common denominator of I. If I'm the only person left, I'll give it a go. Okay. We'll finish in a moment. Let me say a prayer for us uh, as we're here. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these great people in ministry. Many of them would have many years experience far more than I. Some of them perhaps embarking on that journey soon. Lord, I pray you'd be with us in the struggles, that you would be the one we look to. Lord, it would not be seven points. It would not be even a conference experience that's, that prepares, prepares us for ministry. It would be you alive in our hearts. And it would be our relationship with you daily that fuels us and fires us and brings us into the ministry roles uh, and, and prepares us, equips us and journeys with us in the ministry roles that we will do in service of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And tell us a little bit about what Ronan was just speaking about. Inside. So Ronan was talking about the seven struggles of leadership in ministry. Um, it's a brilliant uh, talk about some of the challenges that uh, leaders face um, as they answer God's call. Yeah, what was something that you had that stuck out directly to you? Oh, look, I think the, the number one thing was trying to be purposeful through ministry. Um, too often, I think, uh, especially in my ministry, tend to get uh, caught up in just doing the same things we've always done and sometimes you need to take a step back and think about what's, what God really has planned. Hi, so what I just heard was Ronan talking about the seven struggles of ministry leadership and just going through all of them. And I think one of the biggest things I learned was that the struggles are more about how we go through them rather than the struggles themselves. So it's more about how we work through them. It's really calling us to be an authentic witness and um, there's always going to be struggles, you know, that's the pathway of peace and um, yeah, you know, we're just going to embrace it and just draw, to, draw closer to God in the process. Yeah. Seven struggles of um, leadership in ministry. Um, it was really, really good. He was amazing. I wasn't expecting him to speak so well, but um, the seven struggles, that was really interesting because I guess you always want to go bigger and better, the inflation, but it probably taught us just to be happy with what you've got, accept the challenges, and they're not really challenges, they're like a, how would you say, a, a footstep to grow closer to God. I think for me it's um, not being comfortable because I've been doing youth ministry for the last 20 years, so it's always great to get refreshing new ideas of how to do ministry, and for me it's about shaking myself up and shaking my leaders up and going, actually, how are we working long term? Our youth ministries are just one or two years, but it's a lifelong process of going, I want to invest in a young person's life and in the church, and I also want to be fresh and learn new ways to evangelise all the time. I first attended the Ignite Youth Conference uh, nine years ago, and I haven't missed a single Ignite Youth Conference since. Look, many years ago, I was invited as a speaker for the conference, and that was a great honour, and I really loved that experience. I brought one or two people with me, uh, not as speakers, but to experience the event. They too loved it. And from that very first experience, I committed myself to saying every year, if I can be here, I'm going to make sure that I am. I don't need to be invited back again as a speaker. I just want to be here for myself and anybody that I can bring to experience it. It's the, perhaps the most dynamic youth ministry um, experience that I get to have on an annual basis when we gather for this conference. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for the church to come together, people with different charisms and um, different ministry opportunities and different ministry successes. Bring them together in one place to be able to have a great time of evangelization but also a great time of celebration. So I haven't missed one, don't plan on missing one. Um, I see it important for myself and anybody that I can bring with me to encounter Christ here. Look, in my session about ministry leadership being tough, I talk about the fact that it is a journey with struggles. The truth is that's the same for a faith journey. Often we can come to a conference experience or we can have a retreat experience where we encounter Christ and it's great and it's exciting, but that journey is not always as easy or as exciting. And so one thing that I encourage everybody to do is to equip themselves with people around them, with resources around them, with vision ahead of them, um, with service and ministry opportunities that you're stepping into, so that you've got multiple connections in your faith where you can experience Christ. Uh, Christ can, can touch us from all different angles, not just the one conference experience that we have on one occasion. It's a journey that we go along.
I'm Bishop Eugene Hurley from the Diocese of Darwin, which takes in the whole of the Northern Territory of Australia. And I'm delighted that Shalom Ministry is now in a position to bring some of that good news to the rest of Australia and indeed to the world. Because we live in a world where the media is so influential, it dictates so much of our learning and our attitudes. And so it's so important that the good news of Jesus Christ has to be made available to all people because it's what we each need as human beings to enliven us, to make us more loving and indeed to bring about peace in the world. So it's this good news that the Shallow Ministry is trying to get across to Australia now. Let me invoke God's blessing upon the Shallow Ministry and all who work within it and all who are the subject of its good work. May the blessed Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit descend upon the Shallow Ministry and all who work in it and all their families may keep them at peace forever. Amen. Shalom World, God's own channel.